Morning, Northern Life uh, Church. My name is Jason Small. I'm the uh, D Western Ontario District Superintendent. And it's such an honor to be able to speak with you this morning, both um, Little Current and in Espanola. Love your community, love your town. And uh, <coughs> what, a, what a gift it is to be able to share with you today. I also want to just say how much I love your pastors. And uh, Pastor Jay is just such an amazing, amazing guy. My role is to serve the, the churches of our district, and, and we have roughly 1,500 uh, pastors, credential holders, and, and Pastor Jay is one of the finest, finest pastors. Just love him so much, and Arlene, this, what an amazing, amazing couple, and, and uh, the boys. And so just, I want to say thank you. Uh, what an honor to be with you today. As I was uh, thinking about what to share uh, online today and, and, and as, I, as I preach today, um, I was thinking about the mission and reframing. You ever uh, just need to do re a refresh on things? You know, when you're driving and you kind of get off of the GPS coordinates and it has that little wheel that's, that's just kind of refreshing, refreshing, refreshing. And, and it's easy to kind of get lost on our, on our journey sometimes. It's easy to kind of take a wrong road and, and go down a path we didn't mean to go down. And, and sometimes that GPS just needs to refresh. And I think sometimes the Holy Spirit wants to do that in our own lives and just kind of refresh us on the mission that he would have for us. In Mark's gospel, it, 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 in Mark chapter one, it, it, a story that's familiar to many who have been around church for a while, it says a few days later, when Jesus again entered into Capernaum, the people had heard that he'd come home, and so many gathered there, and there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. It's just, you get this scene that Jesus was there, did some incredible miracles, and, and some would think that this is Andrew and, and Peter's home, but we're not really sure. But, but Jesus comes in, and, and, and there's just such a crowd. Uh, understanding the context of, of how uh, homes were built back then, and in those day and age, there was oftentimes on the base floor, there was a, a, a little spot for animals. Then on uh, the second floor is where, where the meeting would happen. And, and then uh, there was sometimes a third floor or a rooftop area. And, and, and so uh, there's all these people crowded in, so crowded in. They can't, you can't even get in the door. You ever tried to get into somewhere that's just super crowded and you, you get the idea of what's going on. You can imagine Jesus was there. They, they'd heard him. They'd experienced him. They want to experience more of this. But then it goes on uh, to say that there was, uh, since they couldn't get in verse four, there's these friends and these friends come and it said that they, they, they couldn't get in. And so they brought their friend on, on a mat, a, a, a paralytic man on a mat that he'd been lying on. And, and in those day, day and age, there was no uh, social assistance, these kind of things that you just really depended on friends and, and those around you. You could imagine here he's been on a mat and he's, he's paralyzed. And so he's, he, he's probably stinky. He probably has no way to get to uh, a washroom facility of any sort. And so he's probably lying in his own filth and no way to get a shower or a bath. And here his friends take him and they, they, they bring him on this mat and, and they try and get him in to see Jesus, but there's, there's no room. So what are they going to do? And so they decide to climb on up and, and they start tearing apart the roof. And, 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 it, and you can imagine as people are listening to Jesus and looking up and th stuff starts falling, getting in their eyes and, and they're frustrated and, and they're thinking Jesus is going to freak out. Jesus is going to be upset about this. But verse five, it says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic man, son, your sins are forgiven. Wow. Interesting response from Jesus. He doesn't just heal him, but he actually speaks forgiveness. And teachers of law were sitting there saying to themselves, oh, wh what is this man doing that he can, he's blaspheming? Jesus understanding what was going on. He, he says, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier? Verse Verse eight and nine, and he says, get up and take your mat and walk. But you know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And then Jesus goes on. He says to this paralytic man, I tell you, get up your mat, take it home. 
And the man got up and walked in full view of all of them, and they were amazed and praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. What an incredible story. What an amazing moment. Here's, here's these, these friends lowering their friend right, into, right in front of Jesus, and Jesus brings healing to this man. You think of what elation those friends would have after they took this step. You, you think of those around as they're perplexed as to how Jesus could forgive sins and then, then heal up. This interesting, neat moment. I want to talk about refreshing our mission and what God's called us to on earth. James 2.8 says this, if you really fulfill the royal law of God according to scripture, you'll, you're going to love your neighbor as yourself. You're, you, that's how to know that you're doing well, James 2.8 says. If you really, really love your neighbor, that, that, that's the gauge. Sometimes we say, what's the will of God? And it's about loving God and then loving those around us. Philemon 1.6 says that I pray that you'd be active in sharing your faith. Listen to this so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. In other words, if we're not active in sharing our faith, will we really fully understand, comprehend uh, every good thing in Christ? There's something so valuable as you share your faith. I know uh, my son even, he was telling me as he was sharing his faith to, to one of his friends in high school, and he came to me and he's like, Dad, they have so many questions. And I said, yeah, you got to get in the Word. And he said, he said, what's incredible, Dad, is... As, as I share my faith, he said, it's, it's like my faith grows. And I said, yeah, that's, that's what Philemon 1.6 is getting at. 2 Timothy 4.5 says, work at bringing others to Christ. Complete the ministry God has given you. I think that's an interesting, that it doesn't say, you know, it, it's going to happen passively, but there's something intentional. It, there's, there's effort given to, to being on the mission God has. It says, work at bringing others to Christ. Complete the ministry that God's given to us. It suggests that our role in the kingdom is, is something, it, there, there, there's a primary mission to our lives that we have to be intentional about. In other words, we've got to refresh our mission. I feel like so many people are going through life and they haven't really, uh, they're trying to decide on their purpose rather than discovering God's purpose for them and living that out. We've got to refresh the mission God has for us. How do we do that from this story? I want to give you a four things this morning uh, quickly. Number one is if we're going to get refreshed in the mission God has for us, we have to have an outsider priority. It says that, 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 that the doors were fully blocked, that this house was so full. I can imagine from that, their point of view, like they wanted to hear Jesus. Like they wanted to be right there where Jesus was teaching. They wanted to be a part of the action, but but they forgot about the people that couldn't get inside. See, Jesus had just been there and he was coming back. They'd already heard him once and, and, and they wanted to be there. But they forgot about those who couldn't get in. I want to ask yourself, is there those who there's roadblocks for them to hear the good news of Jesus? Is there some, some moments where, it's, where we've, we've failed to make a priority to those on the outside? excuse me, on the outside. I, I see in churches all the time where, where they've lost their missional priority to those that, that aren't in the building. See, the church is this unique place where, where we exist for those who aren't here yet, really. Where we, we, we want to take away the internal barriers or the external barriers to say, we want people to come to faith in Christ and do whatever and have a priority towards that end. I love uh, our church fellowship, our district. We, across Ontario, we, we serve about 360 churches. And so they're all different ways, shapes, styles, these kind of things. One of our, one of our churches is this Nepali church. And, and the pastor, his name's Ash. And he was telling me his story about how he was actually paralyzed. And he grew up in a refugee camp in Nepal and he was a Bhutanese guy in this refugee camp in Nepal, and, and he'd had an accident, and he was actually paralyzed and, and was there on a mat. And he, he said, I was there in my own filth every day. I couldn't, I couldn't move, and I was begging. And, and he said it was actually some Christians that came to him. He said he, he, he almost wanted to take his life. He was so desperate. And some Christians came and spoke to him about Jesus, and he said, well, 
well, you know, that Jesus, uh, I, I can't even have access. And, and in a crazy way, they prayed for him and God supernaturally healed his life. He's now in Waterloo pastoring one of our churches and God just did a miracle over him. I love that this church had an outsider priority to go to somebody that nobody else wanted to go to really. Nobody else wanted to be around. Nobody else wanted to spend the time with. Who's the outsider God's calling you to? Who's ones, maybe it's not the building so full someone can't get in, but, but maybe there's some other barriers there that, 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 that need to be breached so that, that they could hear the message of Jesus, so that they could experience God's power in their lives. They had an outsider priority. Who's God calling you to? Who's on the outskirts of, uh, of where God's at? I remember when I was in uh, Inglehart and pastoring there, and, and uh, we did this barbecue one day, and I had this biker guy show up. And he was kind of all tatted up and had this uh, pretty offensive shirt on. And I couldn't say what was on the shirt, but, but he came in, and he saw that we had this barbecue, and so he stopped in and he's like, I've never been to church before. And, and so I said, why don't you come? He said, oh, I can't come. He said, look at me. He said, I, I don't fit in church. He said, though, he actually said the words, he said, the roof would fall in if I walked into that building. And I said, well, good news. We got great insurance. Why don't you, why, why, why don't you come? If the, the building falls in, we'll fix it. And, and he kind of laughed and, and, and he said, no, I could never do it. And so Anyways, long story short, I got his number, and him and I started connecting, and and uh, he he had a cottage up where where our church was, and so I would go see him every time he was up at the cottage, and and we became friends over time. I said, you really need to you really need to come sometime, and you really need to experience Jesus. And he said, no. Nah. He said, you don't understand what I've done. And he started to tell me, and he he'd lived a wild life, part of a major uh, motorcycle gang, and the whole bit, and. Anyways, long story short, he came to Jesus in a, in a radical way. And I remember him coming in and, and people in the church, when he first came in, they were like, I don't know if this guy should be here. I don't, and, and they said, I'm nervous around him, pastor. Uh, and I said, just have a priority for those who aren't here. And it was such a beautiful story of his life. We, they eventually became to, referred to as biker Bob and, and Bob's life, uh, was, was transformed and, and it was so neat to see. He actually became one of the Sunday school teachers at the church and, and he, he became uh, intricately involved. God did an incredible thing in his life. Do you have an outsider priority for those? Secondly, I, I see from this passage, if we want to refocus our mission and kind of get back on mission, we have to have an outsider priority. And secondly, we have to partner with the helpers. I love that they, didn't, they couldn't do it solo. But instead, they had to come together in unity to help this guy up. I can imagine trying to hoist a guy up on a mat up multiple stories on the outside as their skill and the outside of this house. And I can imagine the first guy that said, how are we going to get him in there? And one of the friends was like, let's go up the roof. And, and they're like, no, that's a crazy idea. And then finally, they decided to do it. And, and, and there's this partnership. I believe... There's something special about the church when we come together in unity. Actually, Scripture says God commands his blessing when we come together in unity. Coming out of the pandemic, uh, I, I feel like in our societies, increasingly more individualistic and our faith becomes an individualistic pursuit rather than a communal pursuit. And there's something about coming together, partnering with those post-COVID when the world is so fractured and I can't be with somebody that has different political views than me, or I can't be with someone that's a different age group or a different economic group or a different race. The church is this great spot where we come together and we work together on mission. My mom always said to me, Jay, find the helpers and partner with the helpers. There's always going to be those that are, are, are the haters. There's always going to be those that are the complainers. Find the helpers and partner with those. I want to encourage you as a church, work together in unity to see what God can do. Have an outsider priority, number one. Partner with the helpers, number two. And then number three is risk in love. I can imagine these guys, they risked a lot going to do this. 
that, that, that there was something a little messy about what they were taking on, that, that, that here they just even engaging with, with this man when, when nobody else would want to touch him. And they, they, they were bold. They broke all the rules. I, I'm someone that just kind of likes when people go for it. I, I love how, how Jesus actually encouraged people to, to kind of get a little, little like go for it attitude when it comes to seeing lives transformed. Remember the story of the woman with the issue of blood in Mark five or, or the Canaanite woman in Mark, or pardon me, in Matthew 15 and uh, uh, who needed her daughter healed and Everything was culturally long, but she just, she went for it anyways. Remember blind Barbaeus in, in, in Mark chapter 10 and as Bartimaeus like called out and everyone's like, shh, quiet, like that's too, too out of control. And he just called out even louder. This story is actually in, in Mark chapter two, the beginning kind of, of a, of a story of those breaking the rules to, to encounter God, like just going for it. Corinthians 5.14 says, for God's love compels us. It compels us. I want to encourage you to risk in love, to try new things. This was new. No one had done this before. No one had, had, had climbed a roof and, and, and dropped a guy in. Like this, is, this was never done. What's God calling you to do that's never been done before? I think of church as one of the the, the scariest words I hear in churches are, we've never done it that way before. I want to encourage you as Northern Life Church to, to, to be open to new ways of reaching people, to try new things. I think of how messy it was. Can you imagine going up there and, and as they start to pull uh, the, the, the dirt and the sticks and the, and, and the cement uh, all away and it starts to drop and, and there's dust everywhere and people are like, ah, what are you doing? As they're ripping those roof tiles off. I'm sure there was a few people that were scolding them and saying, you've made a mess. Risk in love. I remember when I was a young pastor and we were starting out, we, we were in this church in Northern Ontario and a little place called Englehart and we were pastoring and, and um, I remember we, we, we didn't have a lot of money and so we were working hard to, to raise some money to paint the auditorium. It had been years and years and years since it was painted and, and so we, we decided we were going to paint the auditorium and so we finally raised enough money. It was a big deal for the congregation, just a small group of people and, and so we, we worked really hard. We filled all the holes all over and my wife and I all week we're painting and with a couple of the seniors from the church, we painted, had it just looking perfect and so excited. And, and I remember we were just, I'm, I was just so pumped for the church to see it on Sunday morning. And on Saturday, we did a youth uh, service, which we just started this youth group. We just, we hadn't had any youth before. And so this was a new thing and we're, we're trying to get it off the ground. We had a handful of students and I remember them coming in on Saturday night and one of the students decided he was trying to show off to all the girls and he was, he was going up doing a handstand, kind of a, a weird thing to show off with, weird flex. But anyways, he was doing this handstand and walking on his hands across and, 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 he, and he tripped and lost balance and, and he had big size 13 feet and they went whoosh, right through the wall, two big footprints. And I was like, oh no. You know, our freshly painted auditorium, and it was Saturday night. There's no way to fix it by Sunday. And I, and I thought, oh, man, wow. As, as the church comes in here, they're going to be so mad. And, and we've, we've worked hard to raise this money, and we finally got the thing painted, and now this mess. And so the next Sunday morning, the, just hours later, I remember coming into church, and we had this dear elderly lady, her name was Marjorie Harmon, just the sweetest lady alive. And uh, I thought, oh, she's going to be so upset because she'd given to it. She'd worked to help paint the walls. And, and I thought, oh, and so she was there super early. She always got there early and, and cleaned up the kitchen and was praying. And she was in her 80s. And, and I remember her coming in and, 
and looking at it, and I would just kind of put my head down as a young pastor. I was like, I was like 22 years old, and and thinking, oh, I'm, I might get fired here or something. And 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 Marjorie looked at me and she said, oh, pastor. And she got actually kind of teary. And she said, Pastor, I'm so excited that there's holes in the wall. And I thought, what are you talking about? And like, I was so upset. And she said, it means that there's young people in the church. She said, this is good. We need to have mess around. And I thought, wow, what a, I still remember that to this moment. That she could have looked at it and said, ah, we want to get rid of all that mess. But she looked at it and said, Messiness means that there's life in the house. I want to encourage you, risk in love. It was maybe a little costly as well. You think of this, the, 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 this uh, you know, the, the cost of ripping a roof apart. And I'm sure there were some that speculated and said, ah, oh, like money could have been spent better elsewhere than lowering this guy down and, and spending all this money ripping the roof apart and... But if you're the guy that was healed, it was the best spent money ever, wasn't it? I want to encourage you. What are you risking in love? What are you kind of going for? Where, 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 where bringing Jesus, where, where, where we, we refocus the mission to say people need Jesus. I think of some of our, we have uh, some Afghani pastors that, have risked so much. Uh, one of our pastors, his name's Ahmad, and his story's wild. He, 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 he's, he's been the pastor of an underground church. It's been, it's been bombed. It's, it, he's, he's been shot at. He, he's literally risked his life. And, and, uh, and I say, is it worth it? And he said, oh, he said, I would do anything to bring people to Jesus. He said, it it's worth my life. He said, I would do anything. Hmm. John 12, 32 says, but when I'm lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto myself, that, that nothing should be too costly. We need to have an outsider priority. We need to partner with the helpers. And, 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 and third, we need to... Uh, risk a little bit in love. And then finally, I think we need to, if we want to refocus the mission to, to refresh the mission God has for our lives, we need to live miracle dependent. One of these verses, verse five, it says when Jesus seeing their faith, in other words, it wasn't the person on the mat. It wasn't the dude on the mat. When Jesus saw the friend's faith, he acted. That to me amazes me. That if I if I walk in faith in that, if I, if I came and said, you know what, I want to live my life on mission, and that my faith could actually impact and see miracles in other people's lives, wow. What's God calling us to do? They believed that Jesus was a God of miracles. They they, they, they didn't know what Jesus was going to do, but they just kind of had this thought, if I, if I, if I bring my friend before Jesus, uh, there just might be something happen. Do you believe that God can do the impossible? Do you believe that God can, can, can do beyond what we can ask, imagine, or dreams? It says in Psalm 77, 14, that you are the God who works wonders. You've made known your might amongst the peoples. That in other words, that, that nothing is too difficult for our God. We need to live with a miracle dependency. I was in one of our church plants just not long ago and, and in, in Toronto. And, and as I was there, I got talking with, it was, it was just a fresh young church plant. There's, they, they, they hadn't been going for long. They're meeting in a movie theater and, and uh, there's just a handful of them. There's maybe like, 40, 40 people or so. And, and, uh, I, I was chatting with one of their volunteers. She had one of the shirts on from the church and faith forward across. And, and, and so I said, I said, tell me your story. And she said, well, I, she said, I, I don't even know if I belong here yet. And I said, well, what does that mean? And she said, well, I'm a Hindu girl. And she said, I came to Toronto and, and, um, 
this guy in our building kept encouraging me. And I was going through some, some major issues in my life. And, and every time he would see me, he would encourage me. And, and, and then he said, why don't I pray about it? And, and she said, he prayed and God did a miracle in my life. And she said, so I don't know anything about Christianity, but, but I saw this miracle in my life and I, and I can't deny it. And so I'm here and, and, and I'm, I'm seeking Jesus now. Hmm. See, I just believe that God can do miracles. And sometimes we discount and we forget to, to live miracle dependent. Like what would happen if God would just show up? I don't know, maybe you have a friend, maybe you have those around that, that, that you just need to begin to believe that if I bring them before Jesus, something crazy, miraculous could just happen. What could God do in your life as you yield to him? I love this story it just of these friends. I just, I think it's amazing. It, we don't even know their names. But yet their stories are recorded to us to say just everyday regular people who live on mission can actually change the world. They can actually change other people's lives. That God could actually use me to change someone else's life. A few months ago I was... Uh, in a hurry, I was going from one meeting to another meeting. I, I was at a funeral visitation, had to go to a board meeting that night. And, and I was, the, there was a long line at the funeral visitation. So I was a little later than I anticipated and I was cutting things pretty close. And so I was, I might've been exceeding the speed limit a little bit. And so I was driving fast and driving along and trying to, I needed to get to this board meeting. So I was in a hurry and, and then I realized I was low on fuel. So I pull into a gas station. I drive a diesel uh, pickup. And so there's like 10 gas pumps, but one diesel pump. And there's this car in the way. And, and so I was waiting and they were just kind of sitting there. They weren't getting gas or they weren't. And, and I was like, oh, hurry up. And, and, and so finally, uh, I, I was like, ah, oh, you just got to go. So I just get, tried to give the nice little dee dee honk. And, and I drive it, it's a truck, so it, it doesn't have the, it's kind of uh, sound, and it was a little louder than I wanted it to be, and I was like, oh, that sounded rude, and, and, and they just didn't move, and, and I was getting so frustrated, and, and the Lord said, you need to go up to the vehicle, and I thought, no, nah, I don't want to go up to this vehicle, like I'll look like a creeper, and, and the Lord's like, no, you need to go up and, and share my love, and I was like, Lord, but I'm in a hurry and it's not the right time right now. And, and I've honked my horn and it, and it seemed ruder. And the Lord's like, go up to the car. And, and so finally, as I had this conversation with the Lord for a few minutes, finally, I, I walked up and I said, is everything okay? And, and there's a lady behind the wheel. It was kind of a, kind of a jalopy of a car. It didn't look good at all and rusty and and just, it wasn't, she wasn't even, it wasn't even on. And she was just sitting there and, and she looked at me and tears running down her face. And I said, is that like, what can I do? And, and, and she just said, oh, I'm so sorry. She said, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm out of it right now. I don't, uh, I'm going through a hard time and, and I, I don't have enough money to get gas to even get home right now. And, and, uh, she said, I just, I'm so sorry. And, and anyways, long story short, I was able to pray with her and, and speak Jesus to her. And as I put some gas in her car and she said, you know, she said, I prayed today for a miracle. She said, I didn't even know if God was real. And she said, I feel like I've met with Jesus. So many times I miss it. So many times I, 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 I don't, like, I don't listen to the Holy Spirit. I, I can get so into my own route that the Lord's trying to refresh my mission and refocus me on the mission that he has, and I, and I just miss it. But, but every once in a while when I'll slow down and just listen to the voice of God and, and take some courageous steps, when I, when I have a priority not just on my own world or not even on the church, but an, an outsider priority, where I risk a little in love, God will show up and do some incredible things. Northern Life, I want to encourage you. I, I, I love your community. Love Pastor Jay and Arlene. And, 
I'm asking today that would you look at your community and say, Lord, refresh our mission for Espanola, for Little Current, for the whole area around there, that, that God would do something beyond what you can ask, imagine, or dream, that you would have an outsider priority. And, and it's good to care about what's happening in the church, but, but, but don't forget about those, that there might be issues to get there, and that, that you would say, I'm going to have an outsider priority, that, that I'm going to partner with those who are helpers, that, that we're going to work together as a church, we're going to walk in unity to, to, to see people brought before Jesus, that we're going to risk in love, might be a little messy. It might be a little costly. It might be, might be, uh, you might have never done it before, but you're going to go for it and then ultimately live miracle dependent and trust God to do beyond what you can ask, imagine, or dream. Would you refresh your mission this morning? Would you get on mission for what God would have for you and see what God's going to do in the church in Espanola? May the Lord be with you. God, this morning, we come before you. We pray, God, or I pray my own life, that you would refresh the mission of my life, Lord. That you would remind me that it's not just about me or going through the motions, God. And sometimes when I, when I want to get close to you and, and forget that, the, the, that there's impediments for others, Lord, help me, Lord, to have an outsider priority. Help me to, to partner together, Lord, uh, not just uh, the POC, but with all the groups, Lord, who are, are reaching people for Jesus, Lord. Help me to find ones, Lord. And Lord, help me to risk in love a little bit more, to get a little risky in my faith this week. And Lord, ultimately to trust that you are the God of miracles and that you can do beyond what I can ask, imagine, or dream. So I pray this now in your name. Amen. Blessings on you, Northern Life. Praying for you. May the Lord be with you this week.